Thanks, everyone. I am here to talk about the mechanics of being good to each other, not just what you intend, but how you do it. I'm Courtney. I'm an SRE and incident response specialist. And I am going to talk about, as she said, a disaster, a disaster in which no one was harmed, but uh, it's still pretty exciting. Uh, I'll be talking about this as an operations specialist, but a lot of the techniques that we use to look at failures in operations also apply to security problems, whether you're talking about pen testing, reacting to getting popped, or handling vulnerability reports. Uh, you can tell from my vowels that I'm not from around here. This talk was written about North American English, which is hardly a monolith, but it does have a lot of common assumptions. Unfortunately, I don't have the expertise to localize this talk to the Englishes that you will hear most often in this part of the world. And I don't have time to present that information even if I had it. I do have slides from longer versions of this talk which talk a little bit more about the linguistic principles that I am basing all of my content here on, which would help you to extrapolate this to the Englishes that you will hear in your professional and social lives. I will tweet links to the longer versions of this after I'm done here. So let's talk about disasters. Who doesn't like a good disaster where no one died? <laughs> Seattle, where I lived for several years, has the two longest floating bridges in the world. And in 1990, one of them sank over Thanksgiving Day weekend in a storm while it was being repurposed. Uh, since many people here may not know, Thanksgiving Day weekend is the biggest holiday in the United States. It is the biggest travel season of the year. Everybody goes somewhere to go with family, and nobody is in doing their regular stuff. And then, of course, we have Black Friday, which probably you all have heard of. So this happened when there was nobody paying attention. The public reporting to this day is extremely simplistic, but the official investigation found that there were five factors involved, and all of them were required for the bridge to fail. So what was going on at the time? they were doing a process called hydro demolition. They were scraping off the roadway on the existing bridge span because they were gonna turn it from a two-way bridge into a one-way bridge. And they were building a second span alongside. So they're basically doubling the capacity of this bridge. Uh, they, that means that they have contaminated water, right? You are blasting the tarmac off the surface of this bridge. And the original plan was just to let it run off into the lake. Sounds good, right? Nobody's going to get upset about that. That won't be an ecological incident or anything, right? So the Environmental Protection Agency came in and said, you cannot do that. You have to do something with that water. You need to store it. You need to treat it. You can't just let it like, go. Since you can't store water in piles, they needed the container to put it in. Floating bridges are hollow, right? Yeah, so they're made up of these big pieces of concrete that are hollow in the middle, a little bit like a tanker, right? That's how you get something as big and as dense as concrete and rebar to float, is you make it hollow. So they figured, all right, what do we know about this bridge? The bridge is actually in really good shape. Um, all of the concrete was in excellent condition. They like, did a really exhaustive survey, and they like, mapped all the cracks, and all of it was in better condition than they expected, and also it had been over-engineered, so it was floating higher than originally planned. 50-year-old bridge in really good condition. They figured out how much water they could store. They gave themselves a margin of error. They figured out a schedule for like, trucking the water away. They had this whole plan. And over the weekend, there was a storm. One pontoon sank and dragged seven more down after it. Shit is more likely to break when you're fucking with it. <laughs> Important life lessons. OK, so this video is some of the best public coverage that I could find on this disaster, and I'm going to play a little bit of it for you. If I can see my cursor. Built in 1940 in Seattle, a Lacey V. Murrow Bridge was named after the director of Washington State's Department of Transportation. The bridge stood for 50 years, but in November of 1990, a rehabilitation and maintenance operation on the bridge led to disaster. Spanning a short but deep section of Seattle's Lake Washington, the Murrow Bridge floated on a row of 25 hollow concrete pontoons, each 350 feet long. The pontoons were bolted together for stability and anchored to the bottom of the lake. 
the conditions are just right for use of such a structure because the water conditions on, under, under which they're installed uh, are perfect. That is, very seldom is there any ice, uh, very seldom is there uh, a heavy current, and the water is very deep, 200 or more feet. In the fall of 1990, the Murrow Bridge was undergoing a facelift by means of hydro demolition, a process in which highly pressurized water is used to break up the roadway. Since environmental regulations prohibited dumping the contaminated water into the lake, it was temporarily stored in the empty pontoons via access holes which were cut into the tops and sides of some sections. The water level inside the pontoons was carefully monitored so the structure would not be compromised. But on Thanksgiving weekend, with bridge crews shorthanded, a heavy storm hit the Seattle area. Rainwater drained into the open pontoons. Winds from the storm whipped up the surface of the lake, propelling splash water into the pontoons as well. On the morning of November 25th, eight waterlogged pontoons sunk into the lake taking those sections of the bridge down with them and severing 12 anchoring cables of a bridge that was being constructed nearby. While luckily no one was injured, the cost of damage was estimated at $69 million. An investigation of the accident came to a sobering, if unsurprising, conclusion. After very extensive study and very sophisticated computer modeling methods, the conclusion was that concrete pontoons simply don't float when they're full of water. A very unsophisticated mode of failing. The Lacey V. Murrow Bridge was rebuilt two years later. Though it looks the same from the outside, the pontoons that support the bridge have been divided into smaller sections to minimize damage from leaks, a precaution that underscores the structural similarities between floating bridges and floating ships. The pontoons were designed with multiple cells, not unlike the multiple cell uh, super tankers, so that failure in one place would not bring down the entire pontoon. What has happened here? Okay. So that all sounds pretty obvious, right? Like the whole story that they drew there about how this bridge sank seems very reasonable and understandable, and it's not true. So they checked a lot of stuff. You don't have to read this whole slide. I wouldn't think it's worth it. They're, so I'm basing this on a, on a paper, um, which was published after the investigation was finished. Uh, they sent divers down to the bottom of the lake to look at the sections of the pontoons that sank. They uh, looked at the pontoons that were still up. This was a massive investigation. The computer modeling he mentioned was actually really a big deal, too, in 1990. The official analysis says, all of this, this is the shortest way to describe what happened to this bridge. I'm gonna read it for anyone who might not be able to. The loads that created significant leakage were the combined effects of all accumulations of water, including rain after the windstorm, longitudinal flow on the surface of the bridge, so that's water on top of the bridge moving back and forth, and pumping, pumping water out of the pontoons through November 24th, 1990. These loads caused static moments, so that's pressures, that exceeded the threshold for leakage. Existing cracks were opened sufficiently to allow water to leak into the pontoon. Progressive and accelerated sinking began at this time. So that's a nested cascading failure for people who are into that kind of thing, like me. So what actually happened? They had problems keeping up with the pumping schedule. And they had problems keeping up with the pumping schedule such that the water level in the pontoons was not even. There were some pontoons with more water, some with less. It caused torque on the bridge. Then we had wind, also twisting the spans, uh, and water whipped up by the wind. So altogether, the spans started to twist. And the pontoon that sank first had existing non-leaking cracks, which again, remember this bridge was in very good condition for its age, so these were expected cracks and not even as bad as one would expect in concrete of that age. Uh, the flexion of the pontoon caused the cracks to open enough to begin taking on water from the bottom. That pontoon sank and dragged several more down after it because they were connected to each other. 
So that's not the story that we heard in that video, even though the story we heard in that video is extremely understandable and makes a lot of sense to us. And even with all of that, there was something missing from the paper that I read. There's a note that the tankers weren't able to keep up with the pumping schedule, just how I was able to just describe that to you. But no one either asked why or wrote down what happened. So we know that some crew of people running some crew of tankers was not able to follow the schedule given to them by the engineers. But we don't know what was behind that. Maybe they were short on trucks. Maybe they were short on people. Maybe everyone got norovirus. Who knows? But now we'll never know, because no one asked. And it's however many years it is later, a long time, 30 years? About 30 years later, right? So we're never going to know. And this is a big miss. This is something that contributed to the failure of the bridge, that even with all of that careful investigation and all the money they spent, was not recorded. No one does things they think will blow up the world, mostly, except for those of you whose job it is to do that. It's tempting to say the same thing that the experts in that video did. If you fill a bridge full of water, it sinks. The idea was bad in the first place. Nobody should have done it. Come on, people. But generally, people whose job it is not to break things do things that seem sensible to them at the time. Some of you who were at PurpleCon yesterday will remember seeing this in the first keynote. People do things for reasons, and those reasons make sense in the context that the person is in. So you will get better results if you ask about what they knew, why something made sense to them, what makes sense about storing the water in the pontoons. Well, you literally can't leave it on top of the bridge in a pile, right? That's not how water works. We know that. And if you bring in some kind of container, then you have to manage all the containers, right? So they had reasons to think that this was going to work, and they had a plan, and they did a lot of measurement and analysis and thinking about it in advance. Even if what you learn when you ask these questions drives you to go sit in a bathroom stall and engage in fantasy violence as a coping mechanism, that's OK. I've done it. No judgment you're still better off because you know more about what happened and you can make different decisions in the future and talk to people about why you're making those different decisions. So how do we do that? Like, what's the mechanics of doing that? What, is the, what are the actions that we take and the words that we use? This is a crash course. This is real fast. Like, this is the fastest that I can give this talk in. Uh, so here we go. Hold on. Facilitation. I am talking about this partly in the context of an incident retrospective, which was like this long, prolonged thing that they did for the bridge, right? It took many months to come up with all of that information and then to talk about what happened. Um, I do incident retrospectives as part of my day job for when our systems go down and we need to talk about what happened and how to fix them. So I'm going to be using that frame. I will be talking about both what you would do if you were the facilitator and what you would do as a person who is trying to support the facilitator. As a facilitator, your main jobs are to keep the conversation blame-free, not make bad jokes, and run a pretty good meeting. Or an incident. This also actually works for while you're in the incident, right? And you're working with other people to try to fix this. All of these principles still apply in that moment. It's mostly a matter of speed and whether you're doing it all in real time. So let's talk about how to talk. But I'm not here to tell you not to swear. Because if I couldn't say fuck on a regular basis, I would not be able to run incidents. I am here to tell you not to cuss out your team. Don't swear at people on your side. Don't call them names. Don't call the things they made names either. Right? Anything that you make is a part of you. Right? You put your experience and your hopes into that thing. Someone else calls it a nasty name. That's kind of the same as calling you a nasty name. So those are the things I'm saying not to do. How many times during an incident has another person told you something that seemed like a complete hallucination, just like we are not even in the same galaxy? What are you on about? Miller's Law is the way to try to understand what just happened. And I'll read it. In order to understand what another person is saying, you must assume that it is true and try to imagine what it could be true of. So this is coined by George Armitage Miller. Um, I learned about this from Suzette Hayden Elgin in The Gentle Art of Verbal Self-Defense at a very young age, actually, because that's also the kind of nerd that I am. This is the key to understanding systems and people who have different perspectives and experiences than you do. 
This is how you can begin to understand why things are the way they are in any context, but especially a context that's not yours. It's also a critical tool when you're conducting a retrospective because no two people have the same experience of the same incident. Next, let's talk about blame. English is a pretty blamey language. You knocked over that vase. Why did you knock over that vase? A couple things happening here. One is you. You. Yeah, you. I'm talking to you. Don't just walk away from me. That feels terrible. Starting a sentence with you draws a line between yourself and the person you're addressing. It creates an oppositional conversation. There's the person who is saying you and the person who is being you'd at. Why? Why did you do that? Why'd you do it like that? That also feels terrible. Asking a question that starts with why is a request for a justification. It immediately puts the person you're addressing on the defensive. Why questions get you answers in what is called agentive language. Because a person did a thing. Because I knocked the vase over. It has blame in the very grammar. Agentive language is also strongly remembered by English speakers. So you've just ensured that everyone who heard that remembers that it's my fault because I knocked it over. Other things not to say. Always, never, every time, should, just, only. There's more, but these are the worst. These are the ones that really create that feeling of I am putting you on the spot. An example. Why didn't you just fix it the last time it happened? This is not compassionate, and it's not effective at helping us understand the problem. There's a lot going on here, so I'm going to take it apart. This assumes that it's happened before, maybe more than once, that it could have been fixed last time it happened, easily, that's the just, that you was the right person to fix it, and that there was no good reason not to fix it. All of that in this sentence. So, better things to say. How, what, what if, could we, what do you think about, what would you have wanted to know? All of these are designed to get more complex answers when used in a question. When asking a question, think about what you can say that will get the longest answer. This might be hard because, especially in business, we sometimes get in the habit of asking questions that will get us the most concise answer possible, and that's often the right thing in business. But here, we need to do something different. And you may need to practice this. Uh, you may need to work on this grammar the same way that I know that I and most other people I know had to work on like business communication when we started having real jobs. This is a creative process both for you and the people participating. One of the things you're trying to do is imagine a better world. When you ask these better questions, you're, what you're looking for is called a remediation item, an idea for change that we can make to code, documentation, processes, monitoring, whatever, that will give a different outcome in the future. Um, we call this contributing factor discovery because complex systems have complex failures. And talking about a single root cause keeps us focused on finding the one thing that broke instead of finding all of the things that contributed to a problem and that we could then try to address. Human error is not a root cause. When someone says, oh, that was me, I just made a mistake, well, how did that mistake happen? How did the system, the system being things like documentation or playbooks or training or uh, monitoring, how were people able to make that error? What can we do so that error is less likely to occur in the future? There's a lot to work on here. This is the problem of the pumping crews, right? It's the same thing. Try harder is not the way we fix the problem. Depending on people to avoid making errors is unreasonable. People cannot be perfectly vigilant, and they cannot just be better rested. The human you have today is the human you have to plan for in the future, complete with sleep deprivation, small child, hangover, money worries, or some combination of the above. So let's talk about how to have a great meeting. I'm sp I know, but it's possible. I've done it. I'm speaking to you as if you're the facilitator here because these skills are great for everyone to have, but if you aren't the facilitator, remember that the person who is needs you to cooperate with them when they try to do this. 
Stay on time and on topic. If you have an agenda, you should have an agenda, stick to it. This helps keep you from missing things by running out of time. It lets participants know what you'll cover and when so they can be prepared. It helps people stay with the group because if someone gets lost, they are less likely to contribute. Digressions can be boring for the group and inhibit participation. I know all of you have experienced this. So staying on track helps keep that from happening and keeps everyone focused. If you're participating, your job is to help the group stay on track. Before you share, ask yourself if what you have to say is on topic and needs the entire group's attention. And if the answer is no, talk about it later, at some other time, not in the meeting. Keep your eye on the agenda, stay engaged, even if you have nothing to contribute right now. Sometimes the best findings in a retrospective are about the interactions between participants. So you might respond to something that someone else says, and that could be a very useful thing. You can also help make sure that note taking is shared by volunteering or having a rotation for it because whoever is taking notes does not have as much brain available in order to speak. You might need to practice interrupting, but for a good reason, not just because you like to talk. I like to talk, I'm not judging. As a facilitator, you will have to learn how to interrupt individuals for the good of the group. It is necessary when people start to rant or complain or blame or get off topic. It can be super uncomfortable to do this. Remind yourself that you cannot achieve the goals of the retro if this goes unchecked. If you need to practice this, as I do, picture a time when you really just needed someone to shut up so that we could keep going. And they weren't talking about anything that we needed to talk about right now. And you were incredibly frustrated and like feel that feeling of frustration in your body. And then imagine yourself saying, thanks, Courtney but I think we're off topic and we need to get back on topic. As a facilitator, one of your jobs is to make sure that everyone gets a chance to speak even if they have nothing to say. Don't assume that just because a person is silent, it means they have nothing to contribute. They might be shy, they might be having a hard time interjecting. Keep an eye on the participants to see who might want to speak but be afraid to interrupt. Watch for sort of wiggling, sitting on the edge of the seat, leaning forward, licking your lips, that kind of thing, right? The sort of body language of someone who is trying to get a word in edgewise. And if you can take time to stop the discussion, I usually recommend about twice and say, if anyone who hasn't spoken has something to say, this is your time and then wait. Wait longer than you think you have to wait. Wait till everyone's super uncomfortable. <laughs> I mean it. Because sometimes people need more time to get their minds together and get themselves focused so that they can speak. Let's talk about humor, or maybe we could not. It's really easy to mess up when you're making jokes in a retrospective or about an incident in general. You may have heard the saying, comedy is tragedy plus time. In a retrospective, there has not been enough time. There has not, guaranteed. Furthermore, someone, maybe everyone in that retrospective feels like they screwed up and cost the company money, their teammates time, and maybe sleep, and made everyone present have yet another meeting. Probably their manager is there too. Getting it wrong means anything that makes anyone in the room feel even a little bit uncomfortable, even if they don't really notice, or they aren't really willing to admit it to you. Some bad jokes, anything your parents say when they're mad or they think you haven't come home often enough. Anything you say back to them. Anything a manager or other employee ever said to you that made you feel bad. Anything you said to a coworker that made them laugh uncomfortably or wins. Jokes about getting fired or firing people. Politics, religion, current events. Things I shouldn't have to mention, but I'm gonna. Race, gender, sexuality, fat jokes, jokes about disabilities, crazy. Jokes about any one person or their decisions or their wisdom or their face or their plans. You can probably make jokes about Murphy's Law, entropy, computers, which are terrible, the terribleness of getting paged. You can be really, really serious about very silly things. Las Vegas, colloquially known as fabulous. Maybe you can joke with a person about something they are proud of about themselves. I like to talk about myself as the girl with her hair on fire. I am very entertained when people make that joke about me, but if somebody else in the room does not know that I think that's a positive thing, they will be uncomfortable. So be very careful with this last one. If you can't make jokes, how can you lighten the mood? You can be kind, you can be thoughtful, you can be caring, you can call out successes, you can thank someone for their honesty. You can be warm and welcoming. What about when things go wrong? What do you do when people blame or make bad jokes? What about when you make a mistake? If you mess up, apologize, correct yourself, and move on. 
It's important to be sincere and matter of fact. Wallowing is self-blame and it's uncomfortable, time consuming and part of what you are trying to avoid. Sometimes people will blame themselves and you might need to intervene. You just need a short request to them that they stop and then the group moves on. If the person is embarrassed or wants to explain, you can give them a moment, thank them sincerely, and then again move on. You don't want anyone in this room wallowing. Try something like, this is a blameless retrospective, and that means not blaming anyone, including yourself. You don't have to be witty. You don't have to come up with something super cute. You don't need a clever one-liner. You don't have to win. You don't have to one-up anybody. Your goal is to remind people of the ground rules and why we're here, and then move on. You might be noticing a theme here. Move on. If they ask a blaming question, gently remind them that we're trying to avoid blame and help them rephrase the question. This is all you need to say for bad jokes. Please don't make jokes like that here. That's it. No explanation. It doesn't have to be a teachable mo moment in a meeting or retrospective. It should not be a teachable moment because then you're wasting everybody else's time, right? Uh, once you have said this, just move on. Never bring it up again. Never. If they come to you afterwards and ask you what was inappropriate about what they said, and you have something ready that you are willing to say back to them, you can do that if you choose. Or you can just say, please don't make jokes like that here. OK, so what's the point? This might be familiar to many people in this room. Conway's Law, organizations which design systems are constrained to produce designs, which are copies of the communication structures of these organizations. He wrote that in 1968, and it is still true, and we still have many things we can learn from this. And a personal note, in operations, we spend a lot of time feeling like lone heroes or warriors, like we're the only people who can understand or appreciate what we do. There's no one we can go to for help, maybe even that there's no one to trust. And in security, it's the same but more. It's definitely work to try to reach out and make connections with people who have very different job roles, responsibilities, concerns than we do. It takes patience and listening in the sense of Miller's Law that I talked about earlier, and it requires asking the same work of them whenever we can. But it's incredibly rewarding. For me, doing this work is what's made it possible for me to stay in this industry. This work is what enables us to have people who know, who do different things than we do, but who understand a little bit about what we do and who are actually truly on our team. It works in the professional space, in the personal space, and the activist space. In 2019, we don't need more ways to be divided from our natural allies and peers. We need more ways to connect and to support each other and to make meaningful change together. Let's go make bigger and more interesting mistakes together. few acknowledgments here. Um, I've worked on this talk with many people over the years, including Lee Honeywell and Lex Neva, former co-workers of mine, um, other authors and speakers I have listed are people who have really helped me. Uh, and then I learned about how to teach from a variety of people, including some of my knitting and pottery teachers. Thank you.